everyone and welcome to my channel. Today I have a book called Miss Olive Pink to show you. A very large journal and another in my series of Lost Women which I've explained before is about um, Tasmanian women that have been lost in history and they had a story to tell and for International Women's Day I actually did a series of these ladies in journal form to tell their stories for an exhibition. So this particular lady is Miss Olive Pink and her story is rather huge like the journal, it's quite big. And the journal itself was inspired by Jibbard Neary's work, her beautiful forest books and nature journals. It has a, a very earthy, uh, botanical sort of theme throughout it, as did Olive Pink's life. So the cover is made of a fabric that I have echo dyed myself, and it has a few prints that you can see there that uh, pepper tree, pepper tree leaves, and there's a lot of yellow there, which would be from the wattle, the wattle blossom that I used in the mix. And the band that I used is calico with um, some tea dyed lace across it, and that particular band style is one that Wendy from Wendy's Journal Adventures um, uses quite a bit in hers. So. Because this book was so large, I didn't really want to put a closure on it, but it needed something just to keep everything together, so that seemed the most obvious choice to, to go with something like, like that, just to keep it together. The cover, um, you can see a little pink flower print there that's come through, which is another piece of eco-dyed fabric sewn on top. And that actually was a strip of um, an old bandage, a sling. So that will give you an idea of the kind of fabric that was used in, in that. And the pink dyes that have come through, very pretty. And that was geranium that created the pink in the mix. And that's backed with a little bit of cheesecloth and has um, a book plate with Miss Olive Pink typed into it with a fluffy rose soft flower and a button lovely button Miss Olive Pink was born in Tasmania and she spent most of her childhood here but along the way she ended up through no fault of her own and struggling to survive having to move to the mainland of Australia um, to live with her brother for a while and um, her and her mother on, were left on their own and had to kind of etch out some kind of living so they ended up spending a lot of their life there even though she came to and from Tasmania. So anyway, we'll go, we'll go into the, the journal for a look. We'll run through that first. So this um, first section here is very floral and very botanical. Um, to compare uh, what sort of person Olive was in her day to journalers, well Olive Pink would be Australia's version of Edith Holden. She was an artist, she painted flowers out in the desert and she, um, she has quite a collection of prints which are kept at the University of Tasmania and anyone can go online and look at those they are available to look at so if you're curious you can I'll put a link below and you can go and have a look so in the opening section I've used a very floral colorful pocket which is actually a piece of fabric that um, came from um, a recycled item of clothing so I do try to use a lot of recycled items in my books um, they are vintage journals, so I like to give them that vintage upcycled look. We have a seed packet here, um, which is from Tracy Fox, her collection. 
and it says wattle australia so it's um seed pods collected that are actually wattles australian wattles and that's the kind of thing that olive would have collected in her travels she spent a lot of time in the desert following um the wild trails to paint pictures of the native flowers and so she collected seed pods and leaves and flowers to paint a bookmark i've made from you can see better on the white from a native Australian flower which is called a hakea, hakea lorena. We call it pincushion hakea because it has these huge round big balls of bright red and yellow flowers and the birds absolutely love them so you often find a tree of those full of native parrots, um, especially the green swift parrots, the really fast flying ones. They zoom in and get some nectar and the whole tree will be alive with this sound of the, the parrots. So I'll pop that back in there and they are found all, all over Tasmania and Australia and because she went from Tasmania to the mainland and backwards and forth I've got a mixture of Tasmanian flowers and Australian ones, Australian mainland plants, native plants as well. I'll just come back a little bit if I can. No far back as I can get. It's such a big book. It's huge so I hope you can see okay. Um, here I have Olive Pink's her dress where she was growing up where her father's, uh, father's house was, 44 Patrick Street, Hobart, which is right in the centre of the, the city so they were, they were in the middle of it all and her aunt was an artist and her grandmother gave her um, a box of art pencils when she was quite young so she got into art very early on and learnt from her auntie who lived not very far from her. I put a little brooch in there which could have either been hers or her mother's. It's um, a very pretty little brooch with forget-me-nots on it and it does have a little message on the back which says, um, let's see, God's love is with you always. The library cards are from Gibbard Neary's collection and they are very pretty. They've got bluebells and uh, blue flower on this one. And the books that I have chosen to type into them are The Indomitable Miss Pink by Julie Marcus and Olive Pink, A Life in Flowers, Gillian Ward. Now they were the two books that I mostly used to study when I was learning about olive pink and they are uh, this is the indomitable Miss Pink and that story by Julie Marcus is covering her life in anthropology so Miss Pink had several aspects of her life she started out an artist and became an anthropologist through her experiences in the bush and um, so her in-depth life with the Aboriginal people is discussed in Julie's book. So that's a very um, a science style uh, following of her life in anthropology. And the other book is more like the one that I spoke of earlier, which is the story of Edith Holden's life. So this is the, the olive pink story, A Life in Flowers by Gillian Ward and this is an absolutely fantastic book so if anyone wants to learn more about Olive this is the book to, to grab because it really covers her life so well and you'll get an idea through this all the beautiful flowers that she painted and the flowers that she collected to actually paint the pictures that she did so it not only tells about um, her painting but it also covers her early life with her family and times in Hobart. So it's a very interesting read as well as has gorgeous pictures in it. So if you want to get more information on Olive, that's, that's definitely a place to start. <laughs> I'll put a link for that below. So back to Olive's book. Um, so this is uh, pattern tissue 
um, made into a pocket and the reason I chose that is because Olive did sewing out in the bush and she actually taught Aboriginal women how to make their own clothes and she often used things like flower bags to make um, very brief, uh, basic sort of clothing out of so that's why I chose to put the sewing element in there this is a collected piece of wattle so wattle blossom it's bright and yellow as you can see a lot of people tend to be allergic to it because it's quite pollen's fluffy and and floats around in the air so you do find a lot of people are allergic to it but she would have collected and did paint that sort of thing have an envelope here that says live in the moment and that little tutorial that Wendy from Wendy's Journal Adventures put up and she did that one day and it has a little card in there with a flower on and room to write on the back so Olive herself actually had lots of journals she did keep journals um, they were mostly sort of scraps of paper and um, ledger books and things like that that she had scribbled notes in and she wrote copious amounts of notes so for someone who didn't ever want a biography written about her she certainly wrote her own because all of the notes that she left behind give a very clear picture of her story and how she lived it here we have a little flip with a skeleton leaf in it that would have been another item that she would have collected to paint and that little envelope style is um, Patricia Viramontes, uh, the book, the book page queen. She does some lovely book page examples. Of Olive's lost love, Harold Southern, and that was a very, very sad story. She met ha um, Harold in art school when she was in Tasmania and they were they were good buddies for a very long time and she had a couple of his paintings he was an exceptional artist he won many awards and he was doing quite well in the field but then of course um, the army called and he had to go off to war so his life was very short he was killed in the war and on the same day his brother was killed and this was absolutely tragic for um, Olive because um, although it doesn't specifically mention in her notes you know that the commitment they may have had to each other she certainly was very much in love with him and upon her death they found a box with a wedding dress in it and this picture of him she carried with her always it was always in her room above her bed her entire life and she never married so I think she held a torch for this man for her entire life and she said he was her only real man friend is the way she described it whenever anyone asked she was known for her outrageous outfits at the time um, <laughs> in the way that they were a bit dated and a bit old-fashioned for the time that she was in but that suited her. When she was out in the bush she often wore a pith helmet and she tended to wear um, very Edwardian style clothing and I think in a way it gave her a sort of prim and proper image uh, which she wanted to maintain. She, she really wanted to keep the ethical side of things above board and she didn't want to bring any downcast shadows on her life in the bush with the Aboriginals so she, she maintained that um, throughout her working life she didn't change at all here she is with one of her camels in the bush and you can see from that photograph that she has a very old fashioned outfit on with a very long coat and her hat there And this page here, this is from Julie Marcus's book. I just took this out so that I could read you a list and find it easy. Um, Olive Pink's packing list for 1933. So this is what she packed to take with her when she was out in the bush. 
In case number one, she had 12 pounds of pears, 12 pounds of prunes, 18 pounds lexias, 12 pounds of currants, 24 pounds of rice, 14 pounds of salt, a dozen craft cheese, half a pound tin of pepper, half a pound of mustard, 10 packets of grand bits, 2 dozen chocolates, Cadbury, 6 milk, 6 plain, 2 dozen soup tablets, 2 dozen uh, 4 tins of Venkatchalam curry, 2 openers, 6 tins of long life milk, case number 2, 2 and a half dozen jams, 6 tins of salmon, 12 tins of sardines with keys and candles, 4 skim milk, 6 baking powder, 2 tins of boiled sweets, case number 3, 30 pounds of tea, 6 bars of siren soap, blue boiling peas, case number 6, 6 bottles of coffee, 3 bottles of PMU sauce, 1 pound of washing soda, 4 bottles of Montserrat lime juice, case number 7, 2 galvanised billy cans, 20 pounds of bacon, 4 pounds of tobacco twist, 6 times 4 ounce pots of marmite, a pound of washing soda and 26 tins of butter. And that was to last her a very long time while she was out there because there was no coming back to get more. So to lug all this stuff around, she needed the camels. So she had um, uh, she had some some men, of course, to help her. Usually Aboriginal men, and the camels, the camels to help her. So I've got a little description of adventure there, a dictionary. Ooh. Dictionary saying of adventure. Over here we have uh, her camel, one of her camels. This one was called Larry. Larry says he cannot get in the centre of the picture. If I can't be in the centre, I'm not going to have my face in it. Darky says, I'll bother you. Well, I'll just, I'll just have my ears in then. <laughs> So here is her camel collection and her Aboriginal guide here who led her into the wilderness. Um, Quart Pot she calls him, her, her, um, her camel. So you can see her writing, that's her writing on the back. To the Oyu. Okay, so have another little fold out envelope there. With her packing list below, the things she took. And a little camel trinket. Here we have... So we have a circle pocket with a couple of the items that would have been in her first aid kit. Sulphur and camphorated oil. And I have a poem on this side which says the violet. And I put that in because she had two best friends that were both called Violet. So I put a poem in about she always spoke of her violet friends. And I pressed some violets and put in for her Violet friends, Violet Mackenzie and Violet Atar Bartlett, who was an artist. I have some violets pressed in between the pages in a round circle, so you can actually see right through the other side, and in a little vellum pocket, so they're in between the pages. Tea stain, coffee stain papers, a little Tim Holtz cut out flower, much like the little one she used to sketch. You have some more echo dyed pages here, and a huge leaf echo dyed, a little pocket with a postcard in it. She was always writing to people. A little pressed um, flower from the thryptamine plant, 
which grows both here and in Western Australia. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Now that's the cover of a book that she had. Um, she had a copy of and it's one of the only two books to survive of her collection. That one and one on Tasmanian plants. Um, she always had a garden wherever she went. She loved the garden so I put in the garden on that one. And this little folder which is uh, an easy easy B designed folder and it's the kind of thing that she would have carried around to put her notes in she would have she often had ledger paper that she scrawled little bits and pieces on and this one in particular is where she scrawled down about the trees um, in honor of people who have helped the Australian Arid Regions Native Flora Reserve. So her sole task towards the end of her life was to create a reserve out in the desert where she lived and that did actually happen. So there she is, that's Olive. Very classical looking Olive in her hat. She does look like an artist, doesn't she? In her her attire that was known to her, known to be what she actually liked to wear most of the time. A doily and some stitched on calico, the calico frill. Another Tim Holtz cut out flower. And some tulips, a few pages for writing, some more eco dyed flowers, and some stitched um, in cotton that was from the World War. So it would have been um, used for soldiers' uniforms, um, definitely in the colours, army colours army green it's uh, silk it's very strong it must be because it's lasted all these years and it still sews perfectly fine little dragon flip up from dragon on calico with a tim holtz pin which says findings 53 this is a echo dyed print of pepper tree leaf and over here we have some more um sure what plant that was but an Australian native. Little tab with a dragonfly on. And I I specifically put the insects in there because she made a point of saying in her notes how much she hated the insects out in the desert where she was. They used to drive her mad. Another Tim Holtz cut out and some echo dyed paper. Some more echo dyed pages of uh, wattle leaves and this one is her typewriter that she carted around everywhere now she did have more than one because she wore them out but um, everywhere she went the typewriter went with her and she had a little message on the top that said handle with care had some more echo dyed paper there with a bit of a daisy and some more, um, I think that might be hakea, hakea leaves and some pepper tree gum leaves here. Beautiful gum leaves. And some stenciling. And here we have a page that I made like a notebook, which is definitely a jib jibberneary design. And that is stitched in blue and red to make it look like a page out of her notebook which she always took with her to take notes on her plants and things. Olive joined the Red Cross. She helped nurse wounded returned soldiers and I have a picture of her here in her attire. I'm sure she would have made a lovely nurse. 
and I think she did that too because of losing her her bow she felt like the only way she could give back was to actually join the Red Cross and do something positive it's from the National Geographic Society which I felt suited her I just want to live where I can stretch my arms without hitting someone else in the face it sort of acknowledges her love of the wide open spaces and that's a Red Cross pin and her in her uniform there which is a really nice picture of her and this tea set she carried around with her everywhere she went it was her mother's tea set and they bought it particularly with the idea of actually painting it because she used to paint china and things to sell and she decided that although she didn't get around to painting that she really liked it white and she didn't um, feel that she needed to paint it in the end because she thought it was beautiful just the way it was and it went out into the desert with her too so whenever she had dignitaries um, to make a cup of tea in her tent she always had her nice white tea set with her have a little table napkin there which is hand stitched in blue cotton hand embroidered vintage one here we have a couple of leaves that are from a hakia and I have made a pocket out of that in, uh, this is another Jibidneri design pocket which is sewn on to um, some cardstock and some, some book page and made into um, a pocket with the leaves sewn into acetate with a little description of the leaves pin and a Tim Holt style pin holding it all together so this side we have a envelope addressed to Mr A.P. Elkin Professor of Anthropology, University of Sydney, and she used to write to him all the time because when she was doing her anthropology studies, she had to, um, you know, send in the work that she'd done, get advice from him, um, and also ask for money to stay and do more work. So there was a lot of toing and froing, but because she was the only woman who was actually doing that in a man's world. She was really up against it and she felt that, um, you know, even her mail wasn't safe.